Welcome back, everyone. Laszlo Montgomery with you once again. Part 16 this time. We ended so abruptly last episode, and I left you hanging somewhat, making you wait for me to reveal the true superstar of this whole adventure. Someone who not only ensured the success of Robert Fortune's trip, but had no small impact on the world of botany, horticulture, and a whole lot more. The real star of this mission wasn't so much fortune as much as it was Dr. Nathaniel Bagshaw Ward, 1791-1868. In the 1830s, Ward invented an airtight glass and wood case that could be used to transport plant species that grew in almost any climate over long distances. Basically, this device is what we know today as a terrarium. In 1829... Ward placed some soil and dried leaves in a sealed glass bottle. He also inserted the pupa of a sphinx moth. He did this with the intention to observe the moth emerge from the cocoon. But unexpectedly, he observed a fern and some meadow grass beginning to sprout from the soil. This accidental discovery led Ward to conclude that plants enclosed in sealed glass containers could survive for long periods without watering. He continued his experiments for the next four years, and with this knowledge he went on to design these sturdy, glazed cases that would be able to transport plant specimens from one end of the world to the other. By 1833, his invention had successfully shipped plant specimens from London to Sydney, Ever since the dawn of the Age of Exploration, these adventurers tried like crazy to bring back to their lands all these flora specimens they found overseas. But all that salty air on the voyage back killed everything. In 1842, Ward published a book on the growth of plants in closely glazed cases, which laid out how this all worked and why and he never patented it or tried to get rich off his discovery. He just shared this incredible new technology with whoever wanted it. The British East India Company, of course, took great interest in this book. I bet they would have patented it. Up to Robert Fortune's time, whenever plant hunters brought cuttings and samples back to the home country, most everything died on the way. With these Wardian cases, as they were called, As long as you didn't break the seal and kept the interior environment the same as when you first sealed it, the plant inside would keep growing and thriving. This meant that now the risk of hauling live tea plants from China to India, or for that matter, to London, would be no big deal. With this knowledge and with the help of these Wardian cases, Fortune had been able to haul back a nice bounty of specimens to the Royal Horticultural Society. So let's get back to Fortune's adventures. From his book of his travels, Three Years' Wanderings in the Northern Provinces of China, he had this to say about the secrets of turning freshly picked tea leaves into the finished product. Fortune wrote, quote, The mode of gathering and preparing the leaves of the tea plants is extremely simple. We have so long accustomed to magnify and mystify everything related to the Chinese that in all their arts and manufactures we expect to find some peculiar, out-of-the-way practice, when the fact is that many operations in China are more simple in their character than in most other parts of the world. To rightly understand the process of rolling and drying the leaves, which I am about to describe, It must be borne in mind that the grand object is to expel the moisture and at the same time to retain, as much as possible, of the aromatic and other desirable secretions of the species. The system adopted to attain this end is as simple as it is efficacious. This book that Fortune wrote about all his wanderings around this time, 1843, 1844, 1845, really is great reading. Back in 2016, when I launched the Chinese Sayings podcast, I also launched this other podcast called the China Vintage Hour, and I read several excerpts from this book. Alas, the market for those who love to sit around and listen to someone like me read from antiquarian books wasn't as great as I thought. Great stuff, though, if you like that sort of thing. From this initial sojourn to China, 
Fortune brought back invaluable information that was used to make advances not only in botany, but in commerce as well. These chaps, like Robert Fortune, were the real Indiana Joneses of their day. They went out into the wild, mixed with the natives, risked their lives, and carried out these amazing adventures, all for the sake of science or some noble cause. In his book, Fortune described all manners of close calls that he had along the way, any one of them big enough to scuttle the whole operation. But despite all the hardships, he managed to survive. As far as disguising his appearance wherever he went, Fortune wrote, quote, I was, of course, traveling in the Chinese costume. My head was shaved. I had a splendid wig and tail, of which some Chinamen in former days had doubtless been extremely vain. And upon the whole, I believe I had made a pretty fair Chinaman. Although the Chinese countenance and eyes differ considerably from those of a native of Europe, yet a traveler in the north has a far greater chance of escaping detection than in the south of China. The features of the northern natives approaching more nearly to those of the Europeans than they do in the south, and the difference amongst themselves also being greater. End quote. Fortune got to see firsthand how tea was made. The withering, the firing, the drying, everything. He took meticulous notes and made drawings of every step of the process. Many of the most popular teas of the world achieved their maximum greatness through the rolling process. This is what gives different kinds of teas their unique appearance and shape, not to mention taste as well. Here, Fortune described what he observed, quote, a quantity of leaves from a sieve or basket are now thrown into the pans and turned over, shaken up, and kept in motion by men and women stationed there for this purpose. The leaves are immediately affected by the heat. They begin to crack and become quite moist with the vapor or sap which they give out on the application of heat. This part of the process lasts about five minutes, in which time the leaves lose their crispness and become soft and pliable. They are then taken out of the pans and thrown on a table, the upper part of which is made of split pieces of bamboo. Three or four persons now surround the table, and the heap of tea leaves is divided into as many parcels, each individual taking as many as he can hold in his hands, and the rolling process commences. I cannot give a better idea of this operation than by comparing it to a baker working and rolling his dough. Both hands are used in the very same way, the object being to express the sap and moisture, and at the same time to twist the leaves. The leaves being pressed, twisted, and curled do not occupy a quarter of the space which they did before the operation. End quote. When Fortune was finishing up this first stint in China, he had spent some time in Canton and wrote an entire chapter in his book about all the teas for sale there that ended up in Western markets. He mentions all the same names you've heard throughout this series. Bohe, Congo, Suchong, Pico, Hyson, Young Hyson, and Gunpowder. Fortune arrived back in England three years after he left. He brought many of the more than 200 new species of plants he would discover during his illustrious career. In his final remarks in his book, he had written, quote, When we arrived at Hong Kong, I divided my collections and dispatched eight glazed cases of the living plants for England. The duplicates of these and many others I reserved to take under my own care. I went up to Canton and took my passage for London in the ship John Cooper. Eighteen glazed cases, filled with the most beautiful plants of northern China, were placed upon the poop of the ship, and we sailed on the 22nd of December. After a long but favorable voyage, we anchored in the Thames on the 6th of May, 1846. The plants arrived in excellent order and were immediately conveyed to the garden of the Horticultural Society at Chiswick. Already, many of those which I first imported have found their way to the principal gardens in Europe, and at the present time, October 20th, 1846, the anemone japonica is in full bloom in the garden of the society at Chiswick, as luxuriant and beautiful as it ever grew on the graves of the Chinese near the ramparts of Shanghai. 
end quote. So, with the proven success of utilizing Ward's cases, the high ups in the East India Company inner circle knew that the wherewithal finally existed to safely and successfully get the tea seeds and live plants out of China and ship to an Indian port. From the Indian port, the cases would then have to be schlepped in one piece high up the Himalayas to the experimental tea gardens at Saharanpur, and ultimately to Assam and Darjeeling. By the 1840s, early efforts to successfully grow tea in the Himalayas were coming along quite nicely. The EIC now had the confidence to carry out by our modern definition, a kind of corporate espionage. To quote from Sarah Rose's book, For All the Tea in China, quote, Tea met all the definitions of intellectual property. It was a product of high commercial value. It was manufactured using a formula and process unique to China, which China protected fiercely, and it gave China a vast advantage over its competitors, end quote. So the EIC went to Robert Fortune, still basking in the afterglow of his successful China operation. In order to entice him into taking on this mission impossible, they offered to pay him five times his current salary, plus transport to and from China. They approved all his reasonable expenses, and best of all, as far as Robert Fortune was concerned, Anything else that he picked up along the way, as far as new species of plants, including the seeds, that belonged to him. All the honorable company wanted out of him were live tea plants, and enough tea seeds to kickstart the whole Indian tea operation. If they were going to scale this tea venture in India, they were going to need a lot of seeds. Over 100,000 if they could get their hands on that much. Another part of the EIC's plan involved procuring trained tea masters from China to come to India to consult to the British and Indian planters based there. They were hot for all the fine points to growing and processing the tea. And not only the tea experts were required, Fortune was told to bring back any and all tools and implements used in the manufacturing of tea. Up to this point, Governor General Harry Harding had 600 acres of local tea under cultivation in India that, as I said, showed promise but wasn't exportable quality yet. A lot of that was due to the software. They had the tea bushes, which was a start, and these were the Assam varietal of the Camellia sinensis tea bush. Remember from tea part one, you have the China, Assam, and Java varietals of the Camellia sinensis tea plant. So when 1848 rolled around, Fortune was successfully recruited by the EIC to go in and do their dirty work. Sarah Rose quoted the EIC's instructions sent by letter to Fortune. Quote, Besides the collection of tea plants and seeds from the best localities for a transmission to India, it will be your duty to avail yourself of every opportunity of acquiring information as to the cultivation of the tea plant and the manufacture of tea as practiced by the Chinese on all other points with which it may be desirable that those entrusted with the superintendence of the tea nurseries in India should be made acquainted. End quote. Fortune very strongly believed that tea was a substance so important to humankind that it shouldn't be controlled by a single supplier. He went to his grave, believing he didn't do anything wrong. So Fortune's mission impossible, should he decide to accept it, was to get as many live plants as possible out of China, along with a huge quantity of seeds. Just like that. And while he was at it, he also had to procure sufficient tea masters to bring all those brain cells to India and show everybody how they turned all those freshly picked leaves into that magical cuppa that only they knew how to do. Everyone has their price, I guess, and procuring the experts to teach the secrets ended up not being that difficult at all. By the fall of 1848, Robert Fortune was dressed up like a 1940s Hollywood movie star yellow-facing a Chinese person, just like last time he was in China. If anyone got too close, there was a chance they might mistake him for a foreigner wearing a Chinese getup. 
so he had to be as low-key and aloof as possible. Together with his A-team of servants and his trusty guide, a local from the Wuyi Mountain area, he took off first in the direction of Zhejiang and Anhui. The Wuyi Mountains would follow. He already knew Zhejiang and the Huangshan area of Anhui was where the Chinese grew all their best green teas. So getting the lowdown about everything there was to know about green tea was his immediate mission. Last trip, Fortune produced a treasure trove of new understanding. Now he was filling in all the missing info. He learned quickly about the withering process that was so critical to green tea. He noted that as soon as the tea leaves were plucked, they were taken to a central location and spread out over these large rattan plates and allowed to dry anywhere from one to two hours. Fortune vividly noted everything he observed as the raw material was passed from process to process. Since green tea involved the least amount of processing, this was easier than when he was trying to figure out the black tea process. He watched as the slightly withered leaves were next taken to a kind of furnace room where batches of withered leaves were put into a kind of wok heated to just the right temperature. No thermostats back then, and they were still using wood fires. The tea master mixing the leaves in that heated wok had to maintain that fire so as to heat the wok to the optimum setting possible. No manuals were written about how to do this. It was something passed down from parents to children, and in time, you just knew how to do it perfectly. If you're interested, you could see how they do this in any number of Yoku and YouTube videos. I think there are multiple videos of tea makers making every kind of tea as they work their magic. You can hear the leaves sizzle and crackle slightly as the moist part of the leaf comes to the surface. That's where all the flavor was. By the end of this step, the tea leaf will have been reduced to about 25% of its original size. Next step was the rolling part. There were so many different ways to do this. How the loose leaf tea appears when you open up that airtight package is determined mostly by this process. Some tea leaves are extremely small, composed of buds only. And how each particular village rolls their tea after the first firing is always unique to them. Gunpowder tea, for example, gets rolled into these little pellets. Longjing dragonwell tea leaves are pressed flat. All teas have their distinct look. Fortune also wrote about the tedious sorting process, how the leaves are separated into grades. I actually saw this process with my own eyes when I was out in Cheonglai, Sichuan province. I observed a bunch of workers all sitting around a table filled with heaps of finished tea, and they spent all day there. Nimble fingers separating the stems from the broken leaves from the unbroken leaves. The unbroken leaves, as you might imagine, cost the most and were the most prized. If you break open your mass market tea bag, you'll see there aren't any unbroken leaves in there. What you have is called CTC tea. CTC means crush, tear, curl. This process was developed in the 1930s and within a few decades was the standard mass production method of producing tea destined for tea bags. When the dried leaf is processed this way, it produces a nice, quick brew of dark tea. Almost all the tea in India, more than 80%, ends up as CTC tea. The experts and tea snobs well, wouldn't be caught dead drinking this stuff. Not all tea bags use CTC tea. You can get high-end loose-leaf tea now in these pyramid-shaped and extra-sized tea bags designed for whole-leaf artisanal teas. Robert Fortune made the rounds and recorded all his observations. I'll tell you, both the Royal Horticultural Society the first time around and now the East India Company sure picked the right person for the job. Not only was Fortune a first-rate botanist and all-around man of science, he was an incredible adventurer as well. Every expat living in China today surely can appreciate how rough going it must have been 
for a foreigner to get around in the late 1840s compared to today, he faced a lot of hardships and had plenty of close calls. But Fortune was able to roll with every punch thrown at him. I have to say, this was quite a con job he did. I can hardly think of anything more conspicuous than the spectacle it must have been carrying all those ward cases and supplies through the mountains and villages. And I'm sure some were fooled by Fortune's costume, but I'm betting most of the villagers saw something that wasn't quite right about that very strange-looking Chinese guy in the sedan chair. On this second visit to China, Robert Fortune stumbled onto something that later on is going to provide a number of nails that will close the coffin on China's tea export business to Europe. In his trek around Anhui and Zhejiang, especially around Hangzhou, he noted with some horror that during one of the final processes, the Chinese workers were adding some sort of blue-green pigment to the tea to give it a particular coloring. Let me quote what Fortune said about this in his later work, The Tea Districts of China and India. He said, quote, Having procured a portion of Prussian blue, he threw it into a porcelain bowl, not unlike a chemist's mortar, and crushed it into a very fine powder. At the same time, a quantity of gypsum was produced and burned in the charcoal first, which were then roasting the teas. The object of this was to soften it in order that it might be readily pounded into a very fine powder, in the same manner as the Prussian blue had been. The gypsum, having been taken out of the fire after a certain time had elapsed, readily crumbled down and was reduced to a powder in the mortar. These two substances, having been thus prepared, were then mixed together in the proportion of four parts of gypsum to three parts of Prussian blue, and formed a light blue powder, which was then ready for use. This coloring matter was applied to the teas during the process of roasting. End quote. Ain't that something? Incredible that fortune stumbled on this. Prussian blue, if you never heard of it before, is a pigment that's derived from hydrogen cyanide, if that gives you any hint about whether or not it should be used as an additive in the uh, tea manufacturing process. Fortune also wrote, quote, One day, an English gentleman in Shanghai, being in conversation with some Chinese from the green tea country, asked them what reason they had for dyeing the tea and whether it would not be better without undergoing the process. They just remarked that, as foreigners seem to prefer having a mixture of Prussian blue and gypsum with their tea to make it look uniform and pretty, and as these ingredients were cheap enough, the Chinese had no objection to supply them especially as such teas always fetched a higher price, end quote. Well, doing a little arithmetic, Fortune had been able to figure out that the typical green tea drinker in the Americas or in England had by this time consumed about half a pound each of Prussian blue and gypsum. Wait till that word gets out. The next stop for Fortune was to Wu Yishan, arguably China's most celebrated area for tea, There he enjoyed the convenience of shacking up at his aide's residence. I'm not saying much about this local guide, surnamed Wang, but he was quite an interesting and conniving soul. Sarah Rose gives some nice descriptions about this Mr. Wang. He was a tea producer himself, local to northern Fujian, and was invaluable to Robert Fortune as a fixer for everything he needed. Fortune set up his operation at Wang's residence and began at once gathering plants and seeds. This was supposed to be a three-week operation at most in the Wuyi Mountains. Let me quote Fortune as he beheld the splendor of the Wuyi Mountains. Quote, For some times past I had been, as it were, amongst a sea of mountains, but now the famed Bohi Ranges lay before me in all their grandeur with their tops piercing through the lower clouds and showing themselves far above them. They seemed to be broken up into thousands of fragments, some of which had the most remarkable and striking outlines. End quote. Fortune observed an army of tea pickers, all women, who worked these tea gardens scattered all over the Wuyi mountain area. They worked sun up to sundown, April through October. Each tea bush would be picked over every ten days. 
Only the tea leaves from the tips were plucked. A good picker, he noted, could pick 30,000 tea shoots a day. Approximately 3,200 shoots equaled a pound, and that amounted to about 10 pounds a day per picker. At a 4 or 5 to 1 ratio of fresh leaves to fully processed, that wasn't a lot of tea per picker. That's why you had to have a lot of them. Ren duo hao ban shi. Chairman Mao once said that, and he sure was right in this instance. The more people you have doing a job, the easier it is to get things done. This was one of those things the Chinese had figured out over the centuries. That by aggressively picking the leaves every ten days like they did, it caused the bush, as a self-defense mechanism, to ooze more sap into the leaves. There were temples scattered everywhere throughout the Wu Mountains, and the monks who called the temples home were all actively involved in the growing and processing of tea. After spending enough time watching everything up close and gathering all the plants and seeds, Fortune had what he had come to collect. He had this final observation to make about tea. Quote, It is an exceedingly useful plant. Cultivate it, and the benefit will be widely spread. Drink it, and the animal spirits will be lively and clear. The chief rulers, dukes, and nobility esteem it. The lower people, the poor and the beggarly, will not be destitute of it. All use it daily and like it. Drinking it tends to clear away all impurities, drives off drowsiness, removes or prevents headaches, and it is universally in high esteem. End quote. By January 1849, Fortune was pleased to inform the head office that, quote, I have much pleasure in informing you that I have procured a large supply of seeds and young plants, which I trust will get safely to India. These were procured in different parts of the country, some from a celebrated tea farm. End quote. Next episode, we're going to pick up at the point when this tea, procured by Fortune on this trip, is transported to India. Believe it or not, Fortune's part of this black op was mostly finished. But there was still a whole heck of a lot more to do before they'd be packaging tea up in the Indian Himalayas and shipping it to Europe. Everyone involved in this risky endeavor still had a very long and winding road to hoe before the champagne corks could be popped. But Fortune, at least, had done his part. Everything, the seeds, the seedlings, plant cuttings, all were packed up inside the airtight ward cases and readied for transport. Once everything was laden on board a cargo vessel in Shanghai, there was still a rather long and uncertain voyage to Calcutta. This is still the mid-19th century, and these kinds of voyages were still fraught with all kinds of dangers that still happened regularly on the high seas. Once the vessel arrived in India, there was still the logistical headache of getting everything from the plains of Calcutta to the foothills of the Himalayas. This was very fragile cargo packed inside even more fragile glass cases. We'll look at how all this played out next episode. They had some close calls. So, in Part 17, we'll pick up where we left off and what the profound after-effects were on the British tea trade with China. The idea had all along been to steal the secrets of tea from China and use this stolen knowledge to build a new tea industry from the ground up in lands where the British were in the driver's seat. Then, as far as the EIC was concerned, China could be as capricious, uncooperative, and arbitrary as they wanted. If Robert Fortune and everyone else involved in this operation did their job well, no one would need Chinese tea anymore. You know, in the 1870s, the British were able to secret out of Brazil seeds for the indigenous rubber trees, and they packed them in these Wardian cases and took them to Sri Lanka and to their thriving enterprise they had going on in Malaya and kick-started the whole rubber industry there. Anyway, more Robert Fortune next time. I hope you'll come back and see how this all pans out. So, until that time, may it not be too long, this is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from sunny Los Angeles here in the state of confusion, and I hope you enjoyed today's episode and that you'll maybe consider joining me next time for another fine-tasting episode of the Tea History Podcast.